Okay, now time for the second part on pairs uh, of this extra lecture on uh, a bit of type-driven development. Um, and I'll go back to Emacs. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the previous video, I'm trying to implement a few of the prelude functions, so I'm hiding them. I'm trying to implement some polymorphic functions and using the type to guide the implementation. And I've been looking at functions so far, uh, pure functions, and now I will go to pairs. Um, so uh, the type of pairs in Haskell cannot be defined by the user uh, with the same syntax uh, because uh, it has built in special syntax. So it, it might be um, simulated. You could have a data type pair A, B. And then, then say pair constructor A, B. But uh, the first left hand side here, pair A, B, that is written parentheses A, comma B. And that is a type. It's written as, as type star. And the, the right hand side, uh, pair constructor A, B, means that pair constructor takes uh, a value of type A and a value of type B and produces a pair of A and B. And this can also then be written as the type, well, pair AB. Uh, so it is the same thing here as A arrow B arrow A comma B. It is a bit confusing that uh, Pairs in Haskell have the same syntax for the type expression as for the value expression. So you have to be a bit careful to try to keep these two apart. But I will um, not introduce another pair type here, like this one, because we still have to be get used to the fact of, of working with the Haskell syntax. But notice that type A, B has values of the form X, Y, where X has type A, and y has type b. OK, so let's see. A simple function is swap. And swap should have type a, comma b to b, comma a. So one of the nice properties about Haskell is that we can uh, define functions by pattern matching. So we know that swap is a function. So we could start writing swap of p equals something. But we can go even further because we know that P actually has a certain shape. All pairs start with the starting parentheses, have a first component, a second component, and an ending parentheses. So we can directly write swap applied to a pair of X and Y. And this will mean that when swap is applied, it will take whatever value it has apart and give X the name of the first component and y the name of the second component. So swap of x and y should then be some right hand side where right hand side has type b comma a. And we know x has type a and y has type b. So as it is a pair we can already start writing this, comma, and this, because we know that it's going to be a starting parenthesis, a first component, a second component, and a second and uh, ending parenthesis. So for the first component here, B, we only have one choice. It better be Y. And for the second component of type A, we also have just one choice. So it actually turns out, if we line these up, that uh, the syntax of the pair and the syntax of the pair type matches nicely. So we have an X of type A, we have a Y of type B, and now we have a Y of type B and an X of type A in the opposite order. So let's open it, load it, so it's type correct. Let's check if swap of one and high yeah, and that's high and one. And actually, if we swap it again, we're back to the original. 
So I have not named here, but I should define also two even simpler functions, first and second. And I forgot to avoid importing them, so I will add them here because they are already in the prelude, but it's good to define them as well. So a similar function uh, instead of swap is the first. It's traditionally written with no vowels, first and second. Um, so this goes to A and this goes to B. And as you can imagine, first can be defined as taking A comma B. Well, sorry, I should stick to my uh, style here of X of type A and Y of type B. And it's equal to, well, X. And uh, similarly, second of X of type A and Y of type B is equal to Y. Um, there is a, a special uh, syntax which might be useful to give the reader a hint that some things are not needed. And that's using an underscore in the pattern. So Y here is never used on the right hand side. And if I load this, um, well, I just to check it's type correct. Uh, if I insert an underscore, it will still do the same thing. And now I don't have access to this variable name on the right hand side. I can't refer to the second component. And for a reader, that might be useful because then they know that they don't really, this case doesn't need that, that variable. So similarly here, here X is not needed. So we got first and second, and we can try first on the pair of one and high, and we can try second on one and high. Okay, having first and second means that there is another version of swap. So we can define swap prime of the same type, and we can start up out and saying, well, swap time prime takes a pair P, and then it has to produce a pair. So we know a pair has a starting parenthesis, comma, end parenthesis, and we have to have a first component, foo and bar, where foo, well, sorry, foo should have type B. And we have a helper function here, first, no, sorry, second, which will give us a B. So we can use second of P, and we can define bar, as similarly first of P. So this is an alternative definition um, of uh, swapping. We can just to make sure, may check that swap prime um, also works. Uh, it swaps twice is the same as not doing anything and swapping once flips the two arguments around. Um, and similarly as before, if we want to simplify this expression, we can ex replace bar by its definition. And we can, re can replace foo by its definition. And then we got a one-liner that swap prime of P is just this definition. Also, if we want to practice our lambda expressions, we can also define a third variant, swap double prime, where we pattern match on the P here. Or even yet another variant where we pattern match directly on X and Y and return Y comma X. So we have all kinds of different variants, but there is not really any choice in the actual value. There is just one swap function. It just has different ways of expressing it. Okay, we have a number of swap functions. Let's try another one, a SOC. So a SOC is a function and it first takes a pair of an X and another pair inside of a Y and a Z. And it should return something of the same shape. Uh, well, the same shape as the type up here, um, but not the same shape as the left hand side. So here it's a pair with the first component is X and then it's a pair and the second component. Here it has a pair as the first component. 
So we can just swap, switch around the parentheses a bit. So a sock here um, will take a value of say one, three, comma, um, four point five, and then uh, make sure that the first component of a sock is now a pair instead of the second component. So notice it's not the same as a swap of the same thing, because then we would get the one here as the second component. The sock just puts still the one first, but rearranges the parentheses. So this is yet another function which uh, has uh, no choice in its implementation. It's sufficiently polymorphic for that. Okay, we're building up to one of the bonus exercises from week one. And as we're past the deadline now, I can dare to implement it myself. And let's try to use this uh, type-driven development style for doing it. So this is the function type. It may look a bit complicated, but its first argument, if we simply, if I take it here, it's a, it's a function of something to a pair. So the sort of base shape of this is a one argument function returning a pair. So the first argument, we can name whatever we want. We could name it x. Uh, but x might be a bit confusing because the first argument is actually a function. So uh, let's call it f. That's also the name here, f to p. A function to pair uh, indicates that its first argument may be called f. Okay, so the right-hand side is a pair. So we can already start filling it in. Foo and bar. But what are they? What is foo equal to? Let's fill it uh, first with some empty case error message just to see that we got the syntax right. Yes, that's fine. So f to p of f is a pair. Well, it's a pair of foo and bar where foo has this type a to b. Oops, sorry. I'll just say this is of type a to b. And similarly, this is of type a to C. So both are functions. So we can define them given by giving an X here. Um, so this, this step is just uh, sort of adding an argument name. And then we have to see what can we do to produce a B value. So actually we, we have an X and that's of type A. That doesn't do it. Um, so now the right hand side actually it's not uh, a arrow anymore it's the right hand side has type b uh, so how do we get a b well we have an f in scope so f is type a to both a b and a c so if we let's do a local where here uh, if we define a pair p which is equal to f of x, then that pair p will have type, let's indent it a bit, one less. This pair p will have type b comma c. So that is definitely useful because notice we want to produce something of type b here and we have a pair with both b and c in it. So we can apply the first function, first of p. First of p would take the b comma c thingy and produce just the b. It will throw away the c. So we've used the function f to produce a pair, and we called first to get the first component out of it. And then you might guess that we can do a very similar thing here. We can do second of p with the same um, local definition. So now we have a function which has the right type and there are no to-dos left in it. Let's see, can we actually apply it to something? And to do that, we need some test function. We 
because f to p requires an f of the right shape. So we had f1 and f2 and f3 above. Let's call this f4 and give it a concrete type. Let's take um, an int to a uh, bool. Uh, let's, let's do it this way instead. Let's take a double uh, to an int and a bool. So f4 um, of some double, say, call it x, should be a pair. And now I will use round x and even of x, just to reduce what I, reduce what I had introduced before. So let's see. OK, even x uh, is complained, yes, because we can't call even uh, on a double, we can only call even on an int, but we have the function f3 from before. Uh, let's see, that was in the previous video, but I can show where it is up here. Um, so we have f4, which uses f3, which takes a double to a bool and it combines both round and even. Okay, so f4 is one of these functions that we can use to uh, f2p for. So let's reload it and we can say f2p of f4. Well, okay. Uh, let's uh, name this pair as well. My pair equals f2p of f4. So I have my pair, well, which is a pair of functions, one from double to int and one double to bool. So how do I use these functions? Well, for example, uh, uh, one fun is equal first of my pair, and other fun is equal second of my pair. So what is my, that is, so what is one fun and what is other fun? So one is double to int and the other is double to bool. And then I can use one fun on 3.2, which is the rounding, and I can use other fun on 3.2, and that's checking if the rounded value is actually even, which it wasn't here. So notice that uh, my pair is a pair of functions and I can extract the functions and but this first and second I use here they don't know anything about the fact that there are functions in the pair they just extract the first component of whatever they have so that's the, the strength of this parametric polymorphism okay so now we have a little bit of an understanding that the f2 f2p of f takes one of these functions which produces two values and splits it apart into two functions, one going from double to the first component, one going from double to the other component. It still does all the work. I mean, you can see that both the first component and the second component apply f, and then they take first or second. So if it will be more work to apply one uh, fun than to just uh, apply uh, the rounding function here, because if we create a pair, it will build these things and then throw it away again. It might be that the Haskell compiler can compile away some of these, but it's not necessarily obvious. Okay, so now to simplify the expression a bit, um, I had this idea before of when, when you have just an, a name introduced with a very short definition, it might just be as well to introduce, to fold it back, to splice it in. So let's replace P here by F of X and p here similarly with f of x, keeping track of the fact that it still works. And then if we want to, we don't necessarily need to, we can uh, go one step further and see that if we want, we can move the this to a lambda expression. Lambda x arrow, still working as it should. And with this, we can actually splice in and get rid of foo. And similarly, 
we can splice in and I will do this so that we see the symmetry of it. Um, one of the one under the other. No, I want this one here. Okay. So this is it's a, it's a pair where the first component is a function, the second component is a function. They both call f, but one uses the first and the other uses the second component. Still works and it's still uh, well. It's a little bit <laughs> well. I, I can try f to p of f four first of this uh, applied to three point four, and uh, that will do the rounding and. Uh, applying second here, we'll do the check of even. Um, I can do one more simplification. So uh, in the previous uh, lecture, we uh, ex extra lecture, we introduced this function composition notation. And if we scroll up slightly, we can see that the function composition is um, basically this, what we've used here. It applies one function and then f and then first, so we can actually express this as first composed f. And similarly, this is second composed f. So function f produces a pair, first takes it apart, and second takes it apart. So this is uh, now possible to make into one liner again. Um, and this is perhaps the shortest version of this definition. So f to p of f is just composed with first and composed with second. But the men general idea is to take a function into a pair of two functions. OK, let's make sure that it still works. Um, this uh, did the right thing, and this still did the right thing. OK, so then going the other direction, um, as usual, some uh, type-driven development here. We know that it's a function. So now I'm trying to, again, sort of not think about too much at the time, but just seeing sort of this shape. We have a function here, which means we should have an argument uh, and then some results, some right-hand side. But not only that, we know the argument is a pair. So there is a, a foo and a bar and equal to some right hand side. Um, and just to shorten a bit, uh, I would just call it f and g. So I pattern match on the first argument, which is a pair. I, I get a function f and I get a function, function g. And now, whoops, that was not my intended. Um, f has type a to b and g has type a to C. Okay, so the right hand side here should have type, oops, right hand side has type, oops, type A arrow B to C. So let's, for example, use a lambda expression. It takes an X uh, of type A and then it should produce, produce a pair. So we can already say that it's pair with some component hi and ho. I will now not introduce this where clause because we've done it several times already. But we know that hi is supposed to be of type B, the first component of the right hand side's result. And ho is supposed to be of type C. I'll even indent it to match here, hi and ho. Okay, do we have anything, any hope for getting a B? Well, we have a function f. So let's call f. And what can we call f with? Well, we have an x of type a. Similarly, ho here should be of type c. The only thing we can use is g. And g also needs an x. So notice we have used a pair of two functions. We define a function. And the fact that we've got this x in scope means we can use f and g. So we are sort of pairing up the functions f and g. We're, we're using the, these two functions to get a function returning a pair instead. And now if we reload this, it should be possible to 
uh, remember I had my pair here, my pair, oi, my pair, uh, and that has type, well, double, it's a pair, it has type double to int and double to bool. I should mention that it's often useful to, to write a test expression and fill in the type you think it should have and then load it and see, ah, okay, Haskell agreed. Because if it doesn't, doesn't agree, there is something you might learn from the way you've done the type inference. Okay, but my pair here is something which has the right type for using P to F. It's a pair of functions. So I can use P to F of my pair. Okay, what is that? That's a function from double to int comma bool. So I can apply it to 3.4 and get both a three and false. So this is then um, uh, my new fun is P to F of my pair. And let's see what my new fun should have as type. Well, <clears throat> P to F gives from A to a pair, and this A is the same as the input type to both of these. So we have double two and double two, so it has to be double two, and it has to be a pair, and it has to be the int and the bool. Let's see if <clears throat> Haskell agrees. Yes, it does. And my new fun, <clears throat> which I sort of already tested on 3.4, is done three and false. Okay, <clears throat> now we've defined F to P and P to F. And if you look at their types, they are going in back and forth between, so they are sort of inverses to each other. So we can compose them. What equals F, let's see, uh, P, yeah, F to P composed with P to F. So what type does what have? Well, its first input is what uh, P to F asked as an input. So P to F wants a pair, this pair. And then it returns whatever F to P returns. And F to P also returns this type. <clears throat> okay. Now, this is not quite true because I misspelled F to P. Haskell caught me there, but now it's okay with me. So I have a new function called what, um, which is composing these two functions. And it takes a pair of functions to a pair of functions of the same type. And um, to test it out, um, let's um, use um, I'm in, using up all my names. Example one is um, a pair of um, plus one and um, so let's see A to B and A to C. Well, let's, let's make it plus one and even. I'm out of uh, imagination here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what type does X1 have? Integer to integer and integer to bool. Um, and then we should be possible, it's two functions and both start with the same type A, which is integer here. It should be possible to apply what to it. So example two is what of example one. Let's see what example two is. Well, it's a pair of functions. Um, first of example two is an integer to integer function and apply it to three, we get four because it is the function plus one. And similarly, the second component, um, if we apply that, that's the even function, which says false because three is not even. So we have gone a round trip here and we can see that we get actually uh, what is sort of equal to the identity function with this specific type, the identity function on pairs of functions <laughs> from the same A. So, um, this is an interesting round property. It's used also in the logic chapter uh, for week, week two of the course. Okay, time for a break.